Aldous Scrouton is a uh, service hydrologist at the National Weather Service, NWS office in Grand Junction. As service hydrologist, he provides leadership and management for the hydrology program, including hydrologic forecast and warning operations, service coordination, and interagency support for Eastern Utah and Western Colorado. He also serves on NWS regional and national teams, providing expertise for policy and software development. Aldous has been with the National Weather Service for 19 years. Previous to NWS, he worked with a consortium of underground water districts in West Texas. There's water in West Texas? Okay, it's underground. Okay, uh, he was born and raised in Colorado, so he's probably glad to be back. Aldous enjoys the many recreational opportunities water brings to the region, as do we all. So please welcome Aldous to the front of the room. Thank you. Good. I think the uh, time on here is sleep. Uh, Lull you into a, uh, a nap. That's a four letter word in my house. All right. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yes, there is some water in West Texas. Uh, it's also very scarce. So I've always lived in dry climates and dry areas, so. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, go through, uh, this is my little bit of my agenda here, go through the last year or so, uh, kind of go through the past, the precipitation, temperatures, snow, look at the drought, and then uh, we talk about some of the atmospheric changes that we had when uh, this past year, uh, we were familiar with some of that in February, March time frame. Uh, some of the water that we saw, how it came off, uh, and then we'll get into the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, talk a little bit about that, and how it related a little bit last year, and how it either relates or doesn't relate to what's going to happen this year, and uh, what they're outlining. So, some of these graphs are going to be, I noticed when I was back there, I was like, wow, I should have made them a little bit bigger for you. Good thing I made them into two, having two uh, graphs, because earlier I had four on, on the page. So, and you'll see later on, I have six on the page. So, but the trend is that you just, we're basically just looking in this, this one does this have a, uh, oh, it does. So, um, this is Colorado. And what, what I'm, the significance of this is just to mainly look at the colors. So for precipitation, this is actually um, for the water year 2019, uh, temperature departure from normal and then precipitation departure from normal. And so the cooler colors are uh, lower than normal for temperatures, so, uh, and the warmer colors are warmer than normal. And then the, kind of the same idea here with precipitation. Uh, the warmer colors are less rainfall or less precipitation, and the cooler colors and the getting into the blues and purples are more precipitation than normal. Okay? And we'll be going through a number of these graphs, so you'll get used to kind of seeing that color that way. I, for, uh, when I first was doing this presentation or getting ready for the presentation, I, I kind of keyed in on uh, right in here with uh, the uh, Gunnison Valley, but then it was, I saw it was Western Slope, and then after this talk this morning, I was like, oh, I should have widened it up to the whole basin so you could see that. And I do that sometimes in some of my talks, but I'm mainly uh, Colorado, showing Colorado, and, and that way you can kind of see the Western Slope in the whole area. So overall, last, this last water year, which ended, uh, on uh, uh, September 30th, uh, 2019, we were had kind of a hodgepodge a little bit, but mainly we were near normal or slightly below normal for temperatures as a whole for the whole year. So this is averaging all the temperatures in one year and putting it on one graph or one map. And then you can see for precipitation, we are near normal to slightly above normal for most places across the whole. So let's dig into a little bit more, because that tells you one thing. You go, well, for the whole year, no, pretty good. Well, it depends on when you get it and all that. So 
So this is from the uh, January 1st, and you can already see a difference here uh, just from January 1st versus the whole water year, which is October through September. And uh, you can already see that it's, you're showing tendencies of a little drier than normal in some places here uh, since the first of the year. So there was some precipitation that added up last fall in that area that was in that other map and, and isn't in this one. So uh, it's still some areas that were near normal or above uh, normal for precipitation, but some areas that were uh, are also below normal. And then temperatures, pretty close to the same with uh, most areas uh, were near or uh, below normal for uh, temperatures for this year, since the beginning of the year. All right, now we're going to start through month by month. And this is precipitation only, so we're not going to do temperatures on this, this part. So this is uh, percent of precipitation, the normal, percent of normal. Sorry, the food is just starting to kick in. So I'll get it. Um, and then I'll get my sugar pie and then we'll all crash it. Uh, September, do you remember the uh, last September? Not the past one, but the one before and the summer before that? And then remember the, uh, I, I'm not showing many graphs of 2018 because I don't, it hurts too much to look at it. So uh, this will show the indication of how we were heading into the fall last year. It was not looking good. Soil moisture was really down. Um, rivers were down. Base flows were down. It was looking bad. And you can see that precipitation was very low for September. Then October, part of October. It wasn't the full month of October. It was a, it was a couple of weeks in October that actually made this uh, go well above normal for October for uh, the first part of, the, of this water year. So that was good. That was a good start, and it was really helpful after that uh, the drought conditions that we had. Then we went into November. Darn. So, once again, below normal for precipitation. Now, we were a little cooler, and I'll show some maps on that uh, later on, but uh, below normal for precipitation again in November. So we got this little, like, all right, it's starting to look good. <coughs> no, not so much. And then December came, and it was uh, the northern part of western Colorado was uh, going, well, this isn't so great for us up here, still below normal. But then we saw some indications from a few storms that came in to the Four Corners area that helped a little bit with some of the precipitation. So uh, we we're seeing some indications in December then that, oh, well, we might be hopefully on a pattern change. And sure enough, uh, January, uh, we did get some storms come through. It didn't hit everywhere, so some of the valleys, you can see some of the mountain areas uh, were getting more precipitation. A few of the shadowed valleys, not quite as much. We weren't strong storms, but we were at least getting some precipitation in western Colorado um, for January. And then it all turned around in about mid-February. And uh, we were started out dry, and there were still some areas that were dry in February, but then we had uh, some good, strong storms come in with moisture that really hit us and, and brought us well above normal for the month of February. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit later as we go in this, into this. But just uh, remember this graph here on, on February. And if you remember, there was a few good storms in the latter part of February. And then March, hooray! <laughs> so lots of purple, well above normal for uh, March for precipitation. It was looking good. It was really good. Good to see. Um, there were some implications with this. We just had, a, uh, I was at another seminar and we were talking about avalanches. So there were some other impacts that we had with all this copious moisture and the copious uh, snow that we had uh, in March. And so we had some significant avalanches with this too. But we really needed moisture. As you can see, in October we had some moisture, but then that some of that had already melted by the time we started really getting into the uh, winter season. So. Um, so March was really good. And then April started to slow down. 
sort of dry out towards the four corners, but we were still getting a few, we got a few systems in here just enough to kind of keep us uh, going, uh, not to do the same of March, but we could recover a little bit and uh, still have, uh, still have um, a few, a little bit of precipitation and near normal to above normal for most areas. May. Remember May? <laughs> Cold May? Wet May? Hooray May? Really helped us out. Um, it did slow some things down. I know uh, water providers had to start changing how maybe they were thinking and what they were going to do with the reservoirs and things like that. Uh, when the water was going to come out, because we had some melted in, um, in April. And then things close down in May, and we'll see some of that in some of the hydrographs that I have too. So, um, so really good May, above normal uh, precipitation. And then uh, early June, we were still cool, and we still had some systems that came. They mainly hit the northern part of western Colorado. Uh, the southern part didn't get as, uh, as good. There's a few little spots in here that some of the storms hit to bring it above normal. Now remember, June is one of our driest months out here. So when you say above normal precipitation, if your precipitation for June, your normal is a quarter of an inch. Okay, so above normal, you can you know you can get 0 0.3 inches and uh, be above normal. So just remember that too when you're looking at some of these. So there's a lot to this when you're when you're looking at that. But uh, so it was drier, but it was cooler too. So the snowpack is coming off a lot slower. Well, then we get into July and the last part of June and into July. Well below average precipitation. And uh, this, and then even into August, just well below average, you can see that. I'm still looking at this up here. Uh, that may be a little bit of a uh, anomaly with the data. So um, even, this, even this one might be a little bit of an anomaly when you have some sites when you also have such low amount of precipitation in data. So, uh, but basically overall, we, we just went into a dry. As you, as you heard earlier, uh, there's places now that you know you can see the cracks in the, in the soil and things. So we had really wet, thankfully. We had wet May, thankfully. And then we started to get into the summer and uh, the monsoonal flow that we get up here, or the monsoonal bursts, uh, I like to call them, um, because sometimes it's not a true monsoon that gets all the way up here, but we get those bursts of uh, monsoonal moisture just wasn't making it here in the summer. And so we dried out and stayed dry. And stayed dry. And stayed dry. Now we had some, a cold spell in October, so I'll show that. So that was good. There was some snow, and then, but it was still below normal, below average precipitation for October. So it just didn't look good. And then, uh, so I'm showing this one. This is still October here, but I just had to have something to fill it up because I didn't want to make this too big because it looks so bad. Uh, so this is November. So we're looking at, we're below 5% of normal for precipitation so far this month. So sorry, you're starting to get indigestion now after this great lunch that we had. I'm sorry. Um, but it is what it is. It's, we're, we're dry now, and that's, this is why we're seeing you know, how, how dry it is. And we've seen some uh, fire activity because of the, this dry weather, and uh, the base flows have come down, and, and the rivers, and all sorts of issues this year. So I, I guess thankfully we're on the tail end of the growing season with that. Um, the ag partners here will have to educate me a little bit more and tell me how bad, if this would happen at another time, maybe it would be worse. Uh, I think it's bad even now, but uh, maybe it could have been worse if it was uh, slid into May or something like that. So, um, anyway, I'll talk about the next few days and, and we have some ray of hope here. That, that's later on in my presentation. All right, so now we're going to be looking at temperatures. 
So same kind of thing. This is this is October of last year, and then the next one over to the uh, right is uh, November, and then December, and then down in the lower left-hand corner is January, February, and then March is in the lower right-hand corner. And I know you can't because it's pretty far out there, but you can see the colors that are standing out. And you can see that we're, we're overall, as we, uh, from October, we had a mixed bag of some areas were below normal, some areas were above normal as you get towards the four corners and into the San Juans for uh, temperatures. But then when we got into November, it was below normal for most areas. Although precipitation was below normal. So we had the temperatures decreased, but then our precipitation did not increase with that. So, um, then in December we had a mixed bag. It was kind of along the spine of some of the mountain areas and some of the mountain valleys, like Nevison, uh, uh, stayed cool. And then uh, some of the lower valley locations and uh, uh, were warmer than normal. Then for Western Colorado, the cooler than normal for uh, January. So that was good. And then February, cooler than normal. That's when we had that transition. We started transitioning into a different uh, um, regime for uh, the pattern uh, for storms coming in. But we were still getting some northern storms giving us that cooler air that would come down. So from Canada and uh, the last region. Uh, March had mixed, where it stayed well below normal up north, and it started to warm up down south, which is kind of interesting because actually a couple of the storms that we did have in March, they were southern storms that brought really good moisture in March, but they were warmer storms than what you would normally have. So it's kind of a uh, mixed bag there on what you would get, so thankfully it was a little warmer because it held more moisture. Warmer storms hold more moisture, so there's more to work with. We got more precipitation out of it, but it also helped us become a little above normal for our uh, temperatures. All right, so same thing. With, these are temperatures. So this is April and then May. So April, a lot warmer than normal. We actually started getting some melt of the snowpack where uh, the Rivers were increasing. It was like, oh, here we go. We're starting, and that's normal. We get the, the flows usually start in uh, the first and second week of April, and they start to come off. And that's when the snow melt usually happens out here. And we were above normal for our temperatures, so things were starting to uh, rock and roll a little bit with the snowpack, and we were getting concerned flooding-wise too. So, um, and then May happened. They got well below normal with temperatures and just shut everything down. So we got wet and cold, so it kind of shut everything down. So that also made us worry flood-wise because we were thinking, well, okay, now you have all this snowpack up there, and uh, it's well above normal, and it's not coming off during May like it normally does, and so now are we going to wait till June and all of a sudden we'll get a five days of 100 degrees and it all comes off at once. So, so that was an issue that we were concerned about and looking at too. Thankfully, uh, June was also below average uh, for temperatures, so that extended the pure melt period because remember, average temperatures are going up, so if this is below uh, normal, so you're already heating up and you are getting some melt by then, but it is subduing that melt having to come off in a more manageable way. So that was thankful for that. Uh, and then we had the summer. And so above normal, above normal, well above normal. And then October came. We had the storm system. So it was above normal in the first part of October, and then we went into uh, they had it was a couple storm systems, and just a couple of them made the whole month go well below normal for temperatures. And we had we were uh, getting close to some records with temperatures and uh, for that time frame, and even broke some records for being how how low it was. Uh, and then November came, and now we warmed up again. After that nice cooling, we said, oh, winter's here. It was like summer, maybe sort of fall, winter. And then fall came in, so, and, but dry. And so we stayed, uh, we're above normal for uh, 
temperatures and well below normal, as you saw before precipitation. So that's kind of how the year went. So I, I know it's a lot of graphs that way, but I thought it might be good to just kind of go through and remember how did the year look that way and look at it. So let's move over to snowpack. Uh, this is a uh, for the snow tell sites, percent of normal for the water year in uh, 2019. This was actually uh, done in uh, around April 21st or 22nd to try to pick up. So this did not pick up the May and the May snow because there was already some melt. And, and so this is be about when you had your average peak of snowpack. And so that's what I was trying to key on. And we use uh, snow water equivalent. Sorry, I should actually spell that out probably. Uh, most of us here know what SWE is, no, but snow water equivalent. So it's the amount of water uh, that is in your snowpack. You're looking at it, you're using it in the reservoir. So um, when we're looking at the SWE, it was looking really good, uh, very good down in the south. Western part of uh, Colorado, still good over most of uh, Colorado, and uh, northern wasn't quite as good as, as southern, but we had some of those southern storms come in that really bumped that snow back up. I also wanted to include precipitation, because when you're looking at snow tell sites, uh, some of you are familiar, I'm sure, with snow tell sites, there's different um, observation um, instrumentation on at the snow tell sites and so they measure different things and so precipitation is one instrument and then your SWE is a different instrument and uh, so I just wanted to look at how it looked with that dry fall and if we missed anything so the precipitation would include rainfall which the SWE may not unless it rained on some of the snowpack and then it would have some of that but if this precipitation would get some of that um, rainfall that we had in October that turned out to be rain instead of snow at that early season. Anyway. So, and, and even later, a little bit later on. So it was looking good too. Um, well above average. It's a little closer to average on the Yampa and the uh, White River Basin. But well above average too. So that kind of shows me that, okay, we got a really good snow pack. Look good. Let's look at it a little bit differently. This is a statewide graph for the whole state. Um, I have 2018 in this graph. Hide your eyes. If this, that's uh, low is here. 2018 is this green line here. So we were we made some. We were near the lowest. It actually was the lowest on a few of the days in 2018. Up and it went above the lowest for the whole statewide snowpack. That's everything averaged together. Um, and then, uh, but it still was very low. It was 71 percent of peak normal peak for 2018. Okay. Just had to put it there so we could reference a little bit how it looked this year. So. Uh, we heard from the other, we were around 130%. I saw some 134%, okay, a few percent here and there. And so 2019 uh, is this dark blue line. And you can see how, and I'll, I'll look at a few places on this graph there, so you can see that. So did we, was it record snowfall? Uh, I've gotten a few questions. Oh, we have a record breaking year. Well, uh, I'll talk about that in a second on where we might have broken some records, but 2011 is this lighter blue line, and it was a little bit higher overall for its peak. And then uh, the high, the peak that we've, uh, daily peaks that way, we've been higher than that. So it wasn't technically record breaking that way when we talk about snowpack for the statewide snowpack. It was a really good year, but it wasn't totally record-breaking. Now the part that could be record-breaking, and it was it's definitely at some sites that we have that measure the snow, was back in this uh, February and March, which is right in here, you see how the graph and the line to the graph really it was following normal and, and median and just kind of going up here, okay, okay, then it popped up and then, oh, the end of February and March, it just shot up there. And so this area here, there were some places that in that last week of February and the first couple of weeks of March, we had record snowfall for that time period. And we broke some records on a few places um, for the month of March. 
So we did have some record snowfall, but not for the whole season that way, and not for the total peak and the amount of water that's in there. So we've had bigger years than we had last year, okay, just for reference. But we did have some a really good time period that it, it was some record-breaking snow for that time period, and that's what that is. And that graph, is that's a very sharp graph for a, um, snow tell and the average. So you can get sharp ones like that on certain individual snow tells, but when you're averaging all the snow tells across the whole uh, state, that's uh, pretty significant. So, uh, this is another way of looking at it. This is still snow tell data. This is 2019 here. Each of these are the months. Each of the different colors are the months that the snow accumulated and then how much it accumulated against uh, normal, percent of normal. You can see 2011 here, slightly above 2019. 2002, oh yeah, I remember that year, 2002. I see you had still going that. To forget it, but we need to remember these times because that's what we have to try to remember so we can manage our water properly out here in the West. Um, 2018, better than 2002 overall statewide, maybe not in a few places. Um, so we can see the comparison that way. Just another way. And then the, the, this last one is your uh, average or your normal, your median. Uh, when what we get per month. Uh, when. Okay. Now, uh, scaling it down just to the Gunnison Basin, this includes uh, kind of the main stem of the Gunnison, also the North Fork of the Gunnison. I didn't try to be, I wasn't going to be too cute and just get little basins in there, but uh, so let's let's squeeze it down to the Gunnison. We're in the Gunnison Basin right now, so I thought, well, this would be a good. Uh, to kind of look at it a little bit finer scale, so the whole state, see how it looks. So in 2018, Gunnison Basin was 59% of normal peak. So it was worse than the statewide average, it was less. And then when you get up and you start looking at the, uh, the Mesa, the Grand Mesa, it was even worse. It was 33%, I think, 34%, right in there. Of normal that year, it was really bad. So that's that's in this graph. That 33 percent is in that uh, for 2018. So you can see 2018 is this uh, green line here, and the lowest that we had was for that time was this red line, and you can see that we matched the lowest in a few places and beat it in a few places here. Um, unfortunately, on a day-to-day -day basis for 2018 for the Gunnison Basin, but, um, and we were really low compared to that lowest. We were equal in there for a while. All right, so that's 2018. So we came into this 2019 looking pretty poor. So 2019, once again, we were following uh, pretty, we had a little bump up in October. There's that bump up in October. Then we came back to normal. We were following normal and then those big storms happen, you can see those happening here too, and that's a really strong um, slope to that, and uh, showing how strong that was. And we did break some records at some of the snow tell sites in the Gunnison Basin. So we were at 146% of peak. Our high, so the 2011 is in here also, so we beat 2011. Uh, 2011 wasn't the highest for overall for for uh, the Gunnison Basin. I think uh, we can look back at some times like in 1997 and uh, a few of those years. And at any rate, we have been higher, so it wasn't quite the highest year, but we were, we were getting close. It was looking good. And then we came off and uh, slowed down. Got into many, peaked up again, and then slowed, then slowed down. We got cool again in June, uh, late May, and then into June, and then we started to just melt it off as we went into July. So, and again, this is a uh, same type of representation. You see, 2019, 2018, a little more significant difference than statewide. This basin really, uh, 2019, really helped out this basin quite a bit. Not perfect. We'd like to see eight to ten more years of it, uh, at least average or above, to help us out. But 
sometimes beggars can't be choose. So at least we got something. So let's look at a different way. I'm going to go looking at drought and the drought indice. Um, and so this is, is kind of telling the same story, just looking at it a little bit differently. And, and the drought monitor also takes into consideration impacts, not just precipitation and that kind of data, or not just temperature data, but then how, what are the hydrologic impacts, what are the impacts to agriculture, what are the impacts to uh, potable water, what are the, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, and recreation. And, Recreation is low on the list, but uh, it's, it is factored in there too. But you can see by January 1st, we were, remember that we had, it was very dry that 2018 we had, and we were strong drought. I didn't want to put that map up from, we were tiny, we were looking a tiny bit better in January 1st, but so I decided just to go from there, which still showed that strong indication of drought coming into the first part of the year. By April, because we went through February and March, we were backing out of drought pretty quick. And so that was good. We were, and then by May, no drought in Colorado. This is significant, by the way. You don't see this very often. So it may not happen in a lifetime. I mean, it, it's significant to have Colorado drought free. One part of Colorado always seems to be in some sort of dry condition. So, that was a silent effect. <laughs> so, just wanted you to soak that in. All right, because as of November 12th, it has crept back in. And it has crept back in pretty quick. Maybe it's not a creep, maybe it's a fast walk into our area. So we're up to severe drought now in the uh, Four Corners area and, and most of most of Western Colorado, except for this northern, uh, far northern part. Um, and so we're seeing indications of, of severe drought. And you, we saw that in some of the other graphs too, how we just dried out during the summer, we dried out in the fall, stayed dry. And so this is showing another way of looking at that and showing that we're starting to get more impacts that way too. <coughs> All right, so what happened in February? We had a, uh, the February pattern flip. I'm gonna get into some meteorology down the way a little bit. I try not to do too much of that. Um, just, I didn't wanna geek out on everybody here. So, um, so we had some storms that were coming through. The United States is right, right in here. We are right about here, Colorado is. And so, um, in January, we were getting some storms coming down out of the, uh, from the north, and a few from the Pacific came through, and, and so we were getting a few storms here. There was a, there was a storm pattern. But then there was a shift in February, kind of middle of February, where we got this big ridge out in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, there were some indications, uh, the El Nino cycle, it was a uh, stronger, well, we were in El Nino. Uh, and it was, uh, we also had some other indicators with, it. so there's, there's multiple oscillations that are going on. So you have the, uh, the ENSO, the PDO, the NJO, the, I mean, I could just keep going off with those. Um, but they all, there were a number of these oscillations out there that are, some of them are decadal oscillations, so they're happening during, uh, they take a decade to move in and out of a warm cycle to a cold cycle. Um, there's other ones that work on a two-week cycle or a monthly cycle. And then there's the uh, ENSO, which is more of a seasonal. The El Nino, La Nina is more of a seasonal, where it's a few months long, three months. Uh, it can last for a season or two seasons. So um, all these kind of started to kind of come into a certain phase, and that helped this ridge build out here with warm, but then it also helped this trough here build, and that's what helped bring um, the storm systems, and then the important part is this green arrow here. With this trough here like this, the winds are coming around the trough, and so they can now tap into the moisture that is in the subtropics and the tropics. So we were starting to pull moisture in from that area, which was good, abundant moisture. 
And you can see this here on a satellite image with the clouds and the moisture. You can see this moisture coming in. And Colorado was right here. You can see that moisture is coming in with that trough, troughiness and that trough system and the, just bringing that moisture right in. And so this is what we uh, refer to as atmospheric rivers. Uh, we used to call them the Pineapple Express. Uh, I'm showing my age now. Of course, I've showed my age. Even my bio, I've had to change that with the Weather Service 19 years. I've to change that. Just put with it for a long time. Um, but the whole Pineapple Express is what, if you remember that. And then now it's over, there's been more research on it lately, and so the, the, uh, the term is atmospheric river now. And so what it does is it taps into this strong tropical moisture down here, and it brings that moisture and just brings it on up into, uh, along the coast. And there, so you'll have a storm up here, which I showed you on the other one with the, the trough or the storm, uh, mid-latitude cyclone to be technical, and then you get that uh, warm, that moisture tap there. So that's what an atmospheric river is. Uh, I mean, we could get a lot more technical, but that's basically what it's really pulling that moisture in. And we call it a river because that moisture is uh, well above normal amount of moisture that a normal storm would pull in and pull off the Pacific and bring to us. These affect California more. Uh, there were 64 events this year in the West Coast. And you can see all these arrows are showing the different events that happened and hit the different areas along the West Coast. And so there's a lot more research about in California and uh, along the West Coast about these atmospheric rivers because they affect them more. Uh, a lot of times by, they weaken out and we don't get much effect from them by the time we get into the, the middle of the continent. And so uh, you have multiple mountain ranges that are taking their, their uh, moisture out of that storm and, and so we get a lot less here. But this year we had a number of atmospheric rivers that did uh, come in and play a part. And uh, one of them is this one down here. And you can see it's, first of all, significantly farther south. And then it's also this purple, which is an extreme event. So that means it was not only powerful in the sense of the amount of moisture it had with it, it also was slow moving and had a duration that would sit there and bring that moisture inland. And it did for us. So let's look at February. We had a few events that helped us out. There were six of them. Some of them went up into the Pacific Northwest and didn't help us out as much. And actually, some of the moisture went over the top of western Colorado and away from us. But we had this extreme event on uh, late part of February that came in and hit the Four Corners and hit, and hit the San Juan. So that really helped us out a lot with that moisture. And then we had some moderate events that came in that hit right in central California and actually the moisture traveled all the way into uh, parts of the well, parts of Utah and then and parts of uh, Colorado. So that really helped us out a lot with this. And so this is the February. So we had a few in February in the latter part of February. And then we had the first part of March. And where they were not extreme events, but they were significant enough. We already had that extreme event um, that we had. We still had moderate events, and they were able to track far enough inland to help us with that and bring that moisture. So uh, we had three moderate events. Two of them hit that Southern California. One of them hit kind of Central California and scooted more up. And some, some of that moisture went up on Northern Colorado by the time it got to us. These Southern events hit the southern part and the central part of Colorado a lot better, so that's why we got that extra moisture and a really good year, a really good month last year, this last year. All right, so how does that translate to water? Which is interesting because I know we show these graphs and I, I, I see Andy back there. Um, uh, so you showed the temperature, and I've done a few studies looking at that with temperature and showing temperature increase. I did not bring any graphs here, but I'll talk about it real briefly. I see a we do see a temperature increase uh, across western Colorado. Um, but then when I looked at uh, precipitation, 
I see either a, it's a straight line or it's not increasing or there's a slight increase in precipitation. But then when I look at the rivers, I see it decrease in the amount that we had in the rivers. So increase in temperature, either staying stable or slight increase in precipitation and then decrease in river. So be careful sometimes what information you're looking at. You need to look at all of the whole picture sometimes that way. All of it. If you just look at precipitation, you go, oh, we're looking good. The precipitation's actually increasing slightly. But that's not translating into the rivers. So that's interesting. Just thought I'd bring that up because I wanted I, I was like thought about putting that graph in there, but I, did, I didn't. I should have found that graph in there. All right, so oh, hit the wrong thing. Let me see if I can back it up. Not one more. Not one more. Okay. So this is on the Colorado River near Cameo. And uh, so what I want to show, so the black line is the observations at Cameo, and it's showing the uh, the discharge, so it's uh, cubic feet per second uh, discharge at that gauge. And so then the other uh, is showing, the, the colors are showing above normal, green is normal flow, and then uh, the browns are uh, below normal flow, okay? So we were below normal flow, January, February, March, little bump up there in March, little, little tiny bit, in April there, and then flow would in normal increase in April and May, so we got a little bit of bump there, started to increase, we got a little bit of a cool down in May, so it came back down, started to come up, another little cool down, we actually got really close to being well below, below normal because it's uh, um, of that cool time period, and then we started warming up and it shot up because of that great snowpack we had, and then went well above normal, and stayed above normal all the way through into uh, late July to early August, and then started to come down. Now remember, the Colorado River is regulated. Okay, so keep that in mind. There's reservoirs on that Colorado River, so that may. So it's this isn't natural flow. Okay? But you can see how the temperatures and the precipitation. Look like all right, Gunnison, near Grand Junction, same kind of thing. We were below normal to start out with, and then we went up to above, near normal and above normal, stayed above normal, and we've been uh, near normal or above normal, and part of that is also, this is also regulated, so. Uh, next, the Andros River, which is not as regulated, so you can see how it, drop off and then is now with that dryness that we've had, it's back down to below normal with its uh, uh, floats. So we went well above normal with the snowpack and then came back down. You can see this real cold May and early June. Let's look at it a little differently. This is, uh, so observed flow and then uh, uh, Here's your observed volume. So this is volume, and I just wanted to show these real quickly with volume. Um, so another way to look at it, when you're looking at snowpack, you how much percentage of snowpack, well then how much percentage of volume did we get? So the MS at Durango, we got 172% of normal for our volume at that site. At the Gunnison at the Blue Mesa Reservoir, it was 189% of median, or normal, at that site. And then for uh, the Gunnison River near Grand Junction, it was 177%. And this is a busy, I just wanted to show it, and it will be in your, when you look it up online, you can look at that. And it shows the same thing with the percentages and then the year's ranking on what the volumes were. And you can see we were well above average all around the basin, which was really good this year. So it translated into water in the rivers to snowpack. So that's what I'm trying to show you. All right, we're going to look at the southern oscillation, um, the uh, El Nino southern oscillation. And the part, you can look at it in multiple places and it can get very complex. I'm, the indicator I'm going to use is just this area right in here. 
and it's the uh, called the OMI index, and so that's that's where I'm going to be looking. What does that mean for us? In El Nino, it puts more of the storm track to the south of us. Here's Colorado. In La Nina, it brings it up above us. Uh, in a neutral year, your guess is as good as mine. Even these were still as hard to correlate them real well here in western Colorado versus the Pacific Northwest and California. But on a neutral year, it's even. And guess what we were going into? So we were in an El Nino. And now we're transitioned to neutral, and the forecast is to stay, stay neutral for this. So what does that mean for our forecasting ability? It means our confidence in our forecasting ability is lessened. So we don't have as good forecasting ability when we're in a neutral period. Just tell you the facts. <laughs> And it looks like we're going to stay in neutral. That's the percentage of where we still stay in neutral through the, in, in through the next summer. All right, so here's the good stuff. I might take an extra minute if you don't want to. Um, so this is Wednesday. So starting tonight, we have a storm system coming in. Hooray! Precipitation! Looks pretty good. We have two storm systems actually meeting up, one from the south, one from the north. Getting the moisture from the south, the, the cool air from the north, and it'll meet up uh, over us or near us and then come over the top of us. So Wednesday looks like we'll get some precipitation and snow. On the higher elevations, we're looking at maybe 8,500 and above to have more snowfall, and below that, maybe more rain. Um, it is a warmer system as it comes in. Um, and then look at Thursday. Oh, still precipitation. Yay! <laughs> So Thursday, so this is longer, long than so since we're at below 5% of normal for precipitation across the west, western slope, this is really good. And this lasts into Friday, and then even Monday we have a <clears throat> small system coming in, and it looks like may have some snow showers with that. This is a water equivalent, and you can see that the reds are really good, so that's almost two inches of water. Coming in there. So then what does that translate to? One to two feet, possibly 30 inches in some higher elevations across the San Juan Mountains? Possible? Okay. Forecast? Possible? Okay. It is a forecast. I hope it's right. We need it. Yeah, no. All right, so this is a six to ten day outlook. Uh, temperatures are a higher probability of below normal temperatures for that 6 to 10 days from uh, November 23rd, 27th. And we're kind of on the edge of uh, either near normal to a little higher probability of above average. So, for that time period. That kind of stays the same, below, below average, uh, higher probability of below average temperatures and a slight higher probability above uh, average precipitation into through December 1st. It is nice, uh, but then we start to get into above that uh, November, December, January, they're going with a uh, higher probability of above average temperatures. And then we're starting that equal chances is getting in here because remember I said in a neutral year and everything, it's harder to forecast. Even the dynamical models are having a little more difficulty as we get farther out. So parts of Colorado are still in a little bit higher probability of above average for that three month period. Um, but we're starting to see where we're transi transitioning into we don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I could tell you more. But the, the science isn't quite good. Right. Same thing, January, February, March. One thing uh, indicating uh, we don't like to see the higher probability of above average, uh, below average uh, precipitation down to the south of us. So that's not a good indicator as we come into that. So we're still equal chances here. Um, that's better than having brown on the top of this. All right.
Are there any questions? I'm sure Alice at this point. Yes. Yeah. There's been some studies that recently come out uh, about the grand solar minimum that was going into. Some of the studies say it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty peak minimum, uh, like the monitor minimum. Uh, NASA has said it's going to be more like Dalton literacy. Uh, I don't know, like half a degree overall for 2020 through 2055. Have you looked at if that does happen and we do get over overall? <laughs> the question is, is what that means for us here in Western Colorado, the long means have they have, you, have, have there been models of that? Yeah, I, I haven't seen where it's been, where they've downscaled it to Western Colorado. And look at that. I've seen a few of those, and I, I, I'm not sure that we're we know what's going to happen to West, you know, to a particular spot that way. Maybe to generalize, but you know, as you can see, that can really differ when you're talking intercontinental versus long coast or something like that. So, yeah, sorry, I can't. I haven't seen anything. I've seen some of what you're talking about, but I haven't seen the studies that correlate to what's going to happen here in my backyard. Anything else? Before I turn it over to Pam, yes, sir. All the global warms, you get your mind to ask All the global warming, uh, they had it over in Europe, and they found out all the scientists over there were cheating on it, and it was all false. And uh, then all of a sudden, we get global warming. But here in October, it's been the coldest been in October for a lot of years. And uh, I think that they're all wet. I think we've got too many scientists. I think we've got too many scientists that aren't really doing the research. Okay, that is like a full day discussion, right? Can you, can you, are you going to take a stab at that or? Well, yeah, that's a whole, whole other thing there. Um, so like I was saying, you know, when, when I look back in history and looking at the 30-year averages or even looking back at some of our sites that we've had since the 18, late 1800s here in Western Slope, um, I'm showing, it does show an increase in temperature overall when you're averaging that out. So, sure, weather, that's another thing that we are, uh, that uh, we're seeing a trend that we're seeing some of these extremes happen. Look at 2018 and look at 2019. That we hadn't really seen years that were quite that dry and quite that wet next to each other, that close. So there's some interesting things happening right now. So looking at that data, and looking at some of the temperature data, like I said, it does show an increase in temperatures um, when you look at, the, look at the data that we have that way, that it has increased a few degrees over the, over the 30 to 100 years. So. Thank you very much. A round of applause as we uh,